Hello, a very warm welcome to Granada Reports. We're live with the latest across the Northwest. Good evening on the programme tonight. Renationalised failing rail operator Trans Pennines brought back under public control. But will it mean more of our region's trains actually run on time? I can't say I'm confident, no. No, but I can keep my fingers crossed. Loving Liverpool, missing Ukraine. We speak to the duo representing the Eurovision hosts who will be singing while friends and family fight the war back home. Staying with Eurovision, we meet the presenters who will be bringing the show to us on Saturday night. A trip down memory lane for Manchester City. It's now 20 years since they left their former home, Main Road. And in the weather, Squirry doesn't look too happy about the rain today, but I think he's about to go nuts because some fine weather is on the way. So first, is it a turning point for our rail services in the north or just more of the same? That's the question many commuters are asking tonight. The government has announced that it is renationalising Trans Pennine another of our failing rail operators. Well, the move follows at least a year of delays and cancellations by the operator, which runs services across the north of England and into Scotland. It also follows a meeting between Northern Mayors and the Transport Secretary three months ago. Trans Pennine were put on what they called a recovery plan. There were some improvements. But not enough. In March, as many as one in six services were cancelled, often with little notice. Trans Pennine said many problems stem from issues beyond their control. They included the ongoing disputes with the drivers' union as left. So... In just over a fortnight, just in time for the next bank holiday on May the 28th, the operator will be back in public hands. Our reporter Zoll Muldoon has reaction to today's decision. Chaos, shambles, a mess. Words used to describe train operator Transpennine Express. After continuous cancellations and commuter misery, today the government stepped in. To achieve the performance levels I expect that passengers deserve and that the northern economy needs, I have therefore decided not to renew or extend First TPE's contract when it ends on the 28th of May. Latest figures show Transpennine Express cancelled an average of one in six services in March. Commuters in Manchester today say things simply can't get any worse. They've been useless for ages, so, you know, it was only a matter of time before they were um, closed, had the contract reopened. Let's hope we get a better new service. My train was fine, it was about five minutes late, but the one after that was cancelled. So, you know, that's what they do, cancel them all the time. I feel like when it's under government control, uh, it's more, it's more um, direct towards the people. They're unreliable, the drivers, there's never any drivers. And they just cancel them all the time. Like there's been so many delays. Like today, I'm having to go home to Scotland earlier because the train strike tomorrow. I can't say I'm confident. No, no, but I can keep my fingers crossed. I think that's what we're all doing. Transpennine covers Manchester and Liverpool, where the mayors of the two cities have called for government intervention for months. The disruption to people's lives, the damage to our economy, uh, to businesses. You know, we've put up with more than we we should have. Uh, had to put up with but to be fair the government has listened myself uh, and the other mayors consistently spoke out i think the government have bought themselves some time to see whether there would be significant improvement with tpe and there hasn't been but the proper long-term solution is to do away with this fragmented system that we've got and to bring it back under public ownership but the transport secretary today dismissed calls for the nationalization of all rail services stressing this latest move would be temporary Along with Northern back in 2020, Transpennine Express is the second major rail operator in the north of England to be nationalised. But now the pressure's on the government to prove it's prepared to spend the hundreds of millions of pounds needed to level up rail services in the north of England and give commuters a service they need and deserve. I've had days where I've turned on my phone on a morning and seen, quite rightly, a whole list of messages from constituents who haven't, in some cases, been able to get from Staley Bridge to Manchester for nine o'clock. Now, that is unacceptable. It needed a response from government. I welcome the decision, but it has just taken far too long to get here.
First Group, the company that runs TransPennine, blamed the disruption on the ongoing dispute with drivers union ASLEF and said it was disappointed its contract would not be renewed. The end of the line for TransPennine, but only time will tell if rail services in the north start moving in the right direction. Zoe Muldoon, ITV News. So what about the most important people of all here, the passengers? We'll hear from some in a minute, but our correspondent Anne O'Connor is at Piccadilly Station in Manchester for us. So Anne, is there any hope that we'll get a better service? Well, Lucy, Northern Rail was effectively nationalised back in 2020. Now, the pandemic, the lockdown, the lack of travel have somewhat muddied the figures on that. But there have been some improvements. If we look at the year 2021 to 2022, so after the government took over, 67% of their trains, just over two thirds, were running on time. And that was up from 55%, just over a half. Cancellations fell to 3.3% and that was only down from about 4.1% so less improvement there but there has been a big difference in complaints from customers they have fallen from 34,000 when Northern Rail ran the service to just 14,000 since the government took over yeah very interesting stuff um, and the governments in Transpennine both having a go at the drivers union as level about their ongoing disputes um, what are the hopes of that ending well, the ASLEF General Secretary Mick Whelan today said that the government is trying to blame the union rather than TransPennine for what he calls its inept management. He says the company is getting exactly what it deserves for never employing enough drivers. ASLEF is rejecting a 4% pay rise, saying it's well below inflation, risible and unacceptable. Now, of course, members of that union and the RMT will be walking out over the weekend. That will affect this weekend's Eurovision Song Contest final in Liverpool. And then again, on June the 3rd, the All Manchester Wembley FA Cup final. OK, and thank you. Yes, yeah, so many views coming in from you at home on trains tonight. Some of them we can't repeat. Uh, Tony Harley, though, tweeted us to say, privatisation wasn't the answer in the first place. Investment was the answer. The same can be said about deregulation of the bus services, something else that seems to be heading back into public ownership. Yeah, Lisa tells us it's about time. I missed an important meeting in Leeds due to numerous cancellations. Something needs to be done about the poor quality service, especially as they put the prices up every year. Sue Graves says all of them should be nationalised again. It is a service, not a profit-making game. It is not fit for purpose. Shorty says, I don't book with them now, not taking the chance of getting cancelled. I'd rather go by car or by bus. Trains are too expensive and unreliable. Yeah, we've had a few saying that, but Mary and Ed B were quick to point out our Mersey Rail system in Liverpool is superb and pensioners don't have to pay. Nobody does it better than Liverpool, they say. And we should say, well done to Mersey Rail for adding extra trains to help deal with the huge volume of people heading to Eurovision. But they won't be using all stations, so if you are going, it is worth checking those out online. OK, and um, other news today. And a man has been arrested on suspicion of manslaughter after the remains of four Vietnamese nationals were recovered from a mill fire in Oldham. The bodies of the missing men were found last summer, three months after the fire. Greater Manchester Police says the investigation is still very much open. The 34-year-old man is also being questioned on suspicion of cultivation of cannabis and participation in the activities of an organised crime group. And let's take a look at what's coming up on the ITV News at 6.30 with Lucrezia. Bad news for borrowers as interest rates rise to their highest level in nearly 15 years. The base rate goes up to 4.5%. As the Bank of England warns inflation is expected to fall at a slower rate than previously thought. Also, the end of the line for First Group's TransPennine Express after months of delays and cancellations. And... And I'll write your name. Soaring up the charts, why fans suspect Taylor Swift might be releasing her memoirs. Join me for those stories and more at 6.30.
back here. Let's talk Eurovision Song Contest just for a change. It's all happening in <laughs> Liverpool. Uh, so an early warning for you that we will have some flashing images coming up very soon. But let's have a look at the sorts of scenes that you can expect in the city at the moment. <laughs> You just see from that what a great atmosphere there is. That's an impromptu performance by Sam Ryder on the Albert Dock on the steps of the old Granada Reports office. Just look at that crowd. So, two sleeps to go until the big night on Saturday. Tonight, though, the second semi-final takes place later. Yeah, so let's go live to Liverpool. Our correspondent, Victoria Grimes, is near the Eurovision venue, the ACC Arena. But in a very unusual location, a Granada Reports first, I think, Victoria. Where are you? <laughs> Lucy, I am in a very unusual location. Believe it or not, I am in Liverpool's only sauna right on the docks. There's a very good reason why I'm here, because I am in the sauna, the personal sauna, of Finland's Eurovision entry. Carrier, who's here now. Carrier, do you always travel with a sauna wherever you go? <laughs> no, not, not always, because it, it's a little bit hard to do that. <laughs> you can say that again. Yeah, but uh, in Finland, when, when I travel inside Finland, always everywhere is sauna. Well, Finnish people really like the saunas, don't they? What is it about saunas that Finnish people like so much? Uh, <laughs> I, I say it's all because uh, when people, you know, people have some problems, they go to sauna maybe with the best friend. Yeah. Then when they sit sauna and relax, they open to heart. Oh, you know, take, okay. take, take and tell all the bad things and of course good things. But uh, they just say, okay, yesterday my my <laughs> partner left left me. So it's a place of sort of solace, really, that you can have a chat. Is this where a lot of the political decisions in Finland are made as well? Then do you think? In the sauna, the prime minister's in here with with the team. Maybe that's what happens. I don't know. But they don't dress like this, so carrier, because I'm starting to understand <laughs> why you always have a bare torso in your shorts on. Because yeah. it is very hot. But I, I don't dress like here. that when I go for a really, really sauna. You but now we like do that interview. And that <laughs> I don't want to be here naked. <laughs> I'm really glad you're not here naked. <laughs> so, but we can do that if you want. Well, but no, I no, no, I don't. I don't, maybe better, better I don't think the Northwest needs to yeah, see yeah, that. Yeah, I don't exactly. think the Northwest needs yeah. to see that. Yeah. Now, let's talk yeah. semi finals. It's semi final number two tonight. You were in semi final number one on Tuesday. What will the acts be feeling right now? Uh, I think so. Some of these people are nervous. Of course, because uh, now that all happened and they may be can take the ticket and go to final. Yeah, uh, it's a big thing, isn't it? Yeah, it but is. I hope uh, these artists uh, just go and enjoy because this is the one in the lifetime, you know, and uh, if you not go to final, that's it. That's but, uh, it. Yeah, but that's yeah, it. you know. Carrier, thank you. Well, there's one act that doesn't need to worry about going to the semi-finals. It is, of course, Ukraine. As winners last year, they're guaranteed a place in the grand final on Saturday. I met up with Torchy, who are the Ukrainian acts. Carrier, you've met them. They're lovely, aren't they? Great guys, Torchy. Of course. They're lovely. These guys are lovely guys. And they had um, a lot to tell me about their song, Heart of Steel. And there is a warning that this report contains flashing imagery right from the very beginning. Give us a cha-cha-cha out. Well, the song is a statement to say everyone should uh, take inspiration from uh, the Ukraine because in the current situation Ukrainians are able to keep like a positive attitude in such a negative situation and that's what the song is about the song is about strength and courage and bravery and that's what uh, the brave uh, fighters who've been fighting for um, God knows how long you know have been uh, on the front lines doing uh, the best they can and I think it's um, it's very important that we put everything in the forefront you can't never imagine how it's how it is to live uh, with the thoughts that any minute missile can hit you or maybe your family or maybe your friends or maybe a pet this this is just you know every day you woke up with those thoughts you go to sleep with those thoughts have you got a lot of friends still there 
one of my friends is on the battlefield, he is commanding troops. And we were helping him, uh, like buying some walkie talkies, uh, some other things that he was uh, needed. And how worried about them are you? So you don't know what can happen in any minute. We can talk now and next minute someone can die. It must be a strange feeling to be here in Liverpool for Eurovision, knowing what's going on at home. We felt a bit sad that we can't make the Eurovision in our country, but we feel a huge thanks to the United Kingdom for hosting it. And we want to say a huge thanks to all the countries who help Ukraine because uh, together we can beat this evil and have all everybody can have peace. Have you had a good welcome in Liverpool? We've seen a lot of things that uh, Liverpool has done to um, make Ukrainians feel at home and make uh, you know the whole mm, build a whole contest basically around uh, Ukraine, and that's been amazing. And a lot of flags. Yeah. Look, even and a lot here. of flags, yes, as well. <laughs> yeah. So that's amazing. Yes. It just feels like a big family together, so it's, it makes our hearts more warm, our still hearts. hearts. What would your message be to those people from Ukraine who have found refuge here in Liverpool? What would you like to say to them today? And you're going to do it in Ukraine? I say, the most important thing in hard times was not always important to stay strong, strong, strong and free. І скоро ми зробимо все для того, щоб ми перемогли і всі повернемося в нашу квітучу країну і будемо жити разом і робити все для того, щоб наша країна стала ще кращою. I said that uh, all of us live now in hard times, but definitely after the darkness comes light and uh, uh, all of us will come back to our lovely Ukraine where we're going to live, do better future for all of us and make our country uh, marvelous and fabulous. Slava Ukraini! Yeah, what a lovely interview with them. Quite a strange interview before that as well. We'll have the unedited version going online later. OK, time for sport now. And good news for fans ahead of the all-Manchester FA Cup final at Wembley, David. Yeah, that's right. There's a helping hand for United and City supporters heading down to the capital on June the 3rd. Well, the Football Association has today confirmed it'll put on an additional 120 buses to ferry fans from Manchester to the final. Well, that's an extra 60 buses for each club. Spaces are open to anyone with a match day ticket. And it's all to help cut down on travel disruption with rail strikes planned on that day. Well, Bolton, Stockport and Salford also have dreams of reaching Wembley, but in the playoffs. Now, four years after being relegated from the championship, Bolton want to return to it. And they'll have plenty of support on Saturday when they're at home to Barnsley in the first leg of their League One playoff semi-final. It's been a great journey. Um, we've had seasons of consecutive progression and this is no different obviously we had the Wembley victory a couple of months back which will stand us in good stead and we're excited as I said it's it's great we want to get this football club back in the championship but we want progression again and you know this football club I believe belongs in the Premier League and we're going to work extremely hard to try and get there. Well, there's an all-Northwest matchup in the League Two playoffs as Stockport and Salford face each other in the semi-final. Salford have the home advantage for the first leg this weekend. Defeat in their last game saw them only just hold on to their playoff place on goal difference. While for Stockport, well, it's a second chance of going up after missing out on automatic promotion. The objective that we wanted at the start of the season is still up for grabs against a local rival, but I think even the plus four really, really evenly matched teams who all come into the competition in good form. Um, and regardless of who's playing who, probably a toss of a coin games, there's quality in all of the sides. That was one building step was to make the playoffs, so we've done that, that's the first team in the club's history, so that's amazing. And now it's trying to obviously win the semi-finals and get to the final. So. Yeah, if we, if we didn't clinch it, maybe next year we make a bit more pressure, but that's the first time, so there's been no pressure whatsoever. Now, today marks 20 years since Manchester City played their last game at Main Road. After a century at the stadium, they moved to their new home, the Etihad Stadium, following the 2002 Commonwealth Games. Jamal Williams-Thomas has been speaking to fans and former players who have very fond memories of the famous old ground. Main Road was the home of Manchester City Football Club from 1923 until 2003. 
Known as the Wembley of the North, the stadium played host to FA Cup finals, England internationals and was even shared with cross-town rivals Manchester United on two occasions. Emily Brobin became a City fan in her teens and even got the chance to be a mascot. I think the first time I went down to Main Road, I just felt this connection. I thought it was perfectly imperfect, a bit like me. It was what it was. None of the stands matched. You know, the substitutes bench was plastic garden furniture. The scoreboard never worked. What was it like on a match day? It was incredible, you know, just coming to Main Road, the excitement would build, the anticipation would be there. When I was really young, I remember coming to games with my dad and we'd park some distance away. And as you got closer and closer, it was like we were all going to this magical place. And uh, I, I, I sort of miss that. I mean, it still happens, but I do miss that. I do miss that. Moving from Scotland when I was 10, you know, going to Main Road and becoming part of the city family, it was a huge part of my, of my childhood growing up. It was a huge part of my life being accepted, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a now Mancunian. Arguably the most important fixture at Main Road was the Manchester Derby. And in 1989, City's season started on a high when they beat United in the famous victory. Big Steve, who went viral for an impassioned speech about the Main Road days, remembers it well. I don't get it. When they sit here like me, with my fans, my supporters, you have to understand we've been in the mud. Not seventh in the Premier League, not eighth in the Premier League, in the mud. My first derby was my first season as a season ticket over in 89. We beat United 5-1. I was only very young and I just remember that the, the kids on my street were all United supporters. But no, I just remember my dad being happy, all the family being really happy and the, and the, and the atmosphere on the street being a, a bit different for the Blues for, for a change. One player to play in that game was Paul Lake. Whilst en route to the game, he had an inspirational exchange with a supporter. A, a, a fan saw me with his son, and his son would have been about five or six, and he was holding his hands, and he just clocked me. And he just stood up and put his hands together in the prayer position and said, oh, please, please, like this. After the final whistle, there was euphoria around Main Road. People stayed, people stayed and enjoyed the experience. And when you were inside, because we were under the stand, you could hear the singing and it was the, the actual rafters were bouncing up and down. You know, it was, um, it was, it was great to be a part of that. We used to park up in the Kipax car park behind the stand and have to walk through the fans to get to the, into the changing room. And at the end of the game, we'd have to wait in the players bar if, the, you know, if we had a nil nil against Bristol Rovers. We had to stay in there until all the fans were gone. We used to go watch it sit, used to think, oh, how many is it going to be today? Oh, how many are we going to get beat by today? And we always turned out, there was only, there was always, you know, 30,000 there at Main Road, every, every single game, no matter how bad it got. And that's um, proper fans, yeah. When Main Road was demolished in 2004, this housing estate of around 300 houses was built, along with a new school. However, in the middle of the estate, a permanent tribute to club groundsman Stan Gibson was created where the centre circle was. A lasting tribute to what once stood right here in Mossside. I mean, obviously, as a football fan, you want every bit of the ground to be remembered and, and so on. Um, but that's not how it can be, unfortunately. And I, I love the fact that there's something that here about City. Hopefully that'll stay here for generations. And if you want to see more on Main Road, well, there's an extended version of Jamal's report on our website. There we go. Old stadiums. I mean, the new ones are good, but the old ones are yeah. still great. Oh, I don't know. They're not looking back at the moment, are they? <laughs> I think Jam enjoyed doing that report. I think he did. He'll be watching it over and over again <laughs> on our website. OK, let's get back to Europe's biggest party night this weekend. And if you're watching at home, have you chosen your outfit for Eurovision yet? There's some fabulous ones around already, and the live final is on Saturday night. It is on BBC One at 8 o'clock, and it will be brought to you by a whole heap of famous faces. Our entertainment correspondent Caroline Whitmore went to find out how excited they are. Well, ahead of the big night, we've had the chance to meet the Eurovision presenters here at the British Music Experience, where, fun fact, Sam Ryder's Spaceman jumpsuit is now on display until next year. Hands up if you're excited for the Eurovision Song Contest 2023 in Liverpool! Yeah! <laughs> this top's really tired, so I'm going to do it up to me. <laughs>
Someone put his hands up. There they are. <laughs> How proud are you to, to be part of this? So proud. The excitement is really well and truly on. Banners were popping up on the tunnels, on buses, in cafes. Menus have changed. I think there's you know paintings of Sam Ryder in some cafes. But ultimately... We're representing the Ukraine. We're hopefully going to put on a good show for them. We've got a huge responsibility this year. I think, you know, all of us have fallen in love with Eurovision in a way we never have before because we're doing this for our friends in Ukraine. It's given it a whole new meaning. And we love Liverpool. It's the heart and soul of music. Yeah. The people up here are so passionate. And tell us your role within the Eurovision. Well, I'm going to keep it all together. <laughs> of course she is. Not. Julia, you're a huge music star in Ukraine. How excited are you that we are kind of putting this song together as, you know, united by music? I think that's right slogan and that's right feeling. People in Ukraine are waiting for this. Unfortunately, the war is going on. We still need your support and we're really grateful to, to the whole civilized world who yeah. supports Ukraine. Yeah. We are here for, for the music, of course, but for me, just as much, we are here absolute lock tight solid hands across the water with Ukraine and that's why I had to get involved. Yeah. Me and Rylan are going to be uh, doing it on the radio, the final, which means we have to describe everything because it's the radio and you can't see it yeah. on Radio 2. Yeah. Yeah. Me and Scott, we've done this now for what, six years together now <laughs> yeah. and we are Eurovision husbands. So Scott, Scott, Scott's than seen me, yeah Scott's seen me in positions he shouldn't have. <laughs> I've seen um, you at your best and your worst. Best and worst is exactly the way to describe this. My role is I'm receiving the baton. And then passing it back. And passing it back to Graham Norton in the commentary box. I think I'm the first ever woman to Do be the love that. in the final. Yeah. Who is the biggest Eurovision fan? I think oh. it's you. Action. Im Sereli Utesta Vodkeri Yehong Nenen Armam. The Ant and Deck thing, oh my goodness. Oh. Every time now are you like, is this They've real? Them two little Jordans. <laughs> <laughs> oh, honestly, there's been, I had to do some green screen filming the other day for Eurovision and I walked in and was like, hang on, yes, <laughs> am I check. riding anyone here? Like, they've ruined my career. Good luck with it, enjoy it. Happy Eurovision. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Ba, ba, ba. Yes, get me in there. I'll go on that stage. <laughs> It's going to be brilliant, isn't it? It is, actually. It's <laughs> sweet, Caroline. Yeah. Of course. Here's Emma with the weather. Mum, wet wipes, toilet or bin? Bin. Why? United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Hello there, very good evening to you and I hope you had a good day. So, another day, another Eurovision semi-final and it's almost like nature is waving the flag for Ukraine, waving a flag all of its own, the blue of the sky and the yellow of the wildflowers of the field there, absolutely gorgeous. Do you know, I've had no pictures of showers today, just the sunny spells, although we just have a few threatening skies, but generally that sunshine this morning put a smile on everyone's face. There are still a few thunderstorms rattling around, however, at the moment. May just continue for a wee while longer, but things do turn dry overnight and then everything stabilises for Friday and Saturday. And that's all down to pressure building from the southwest here, from the Atlantic, so dampening down those showers. However, on Sunday, this cold front could bring a spell of wet and quite gusty weather on that day itself, leaving us with a legacy of showers on Monday and also slightly cooler temperatures. But Saturday looks like being the best day of the next few. It's been quite dull and disappointing so far this spring uh, so hope for a, a little something better the next couple of days overnight tonight it's all quite calm as I say everything dries up some clear spells there temperatures holding up well and here is sunrise and sunset times for tomorrow sun's up at 5 15 sets at 9 in the evening so it could be a bit of a gray start in places but there will be a brightening up period before some more cloud blows across in the afternoon it's all coming from a northeasterly direction in the sunshine it's actually not going to feel too bad at all 17 is 63 so quite warm in those areas and also the further east you are, a little bit on the chilly side on the fringes of that cloud. Getting a bit breezier later in the afternoon. Saturday, warm and sunny, wet and a bit gusty on Sunday and then showery and cooler on Monday. Bye-bye. Cleaned up well. United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. OK, let's uh, leave you with live images from Liverpool as we build towards Saturday night's grand final of Eurovision. And we're going Eurovision-tastic on tomorrow night's show, so do not miss it. Yeah, what a great time to be in Liverpool, the city that's really taken Eurovision in Ukraine to its heart. Good night. Bye-bye.